give a very, very, we'll give a very brief overview of smart noise. I think most people here are familiar with tech, the technology that we're all talking about. Um, and a little bit about the smart noise early adopter program that I've been running with our team at Microsoft and with Harvard over the last couple months. But really the meat of this session is to let Cubic um, talk about their use case and the Urban Institute to talk about their use case. And hopefully we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers at the end. Uh, so with that, let me introduce the folks who are here with us today. Um, from Cubic, um, we have Brennan Lake, who's a Vice President of Research Partnerships and Data for Good at Cubic. Um, he's responsible for driving all of the positive social impact that is responsible for that they're responsibly used with the location with their location data. Um, and prior prior to Cubic, Brennan was co-director of the Technology Exchange Lab. It's an international NGO that enables innovative tech, technology solutions solving poverty problems. Um, he's also spent years living in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where he co-founded a SaaS platform that democratizes e-commerce for small businesses in Latin America. Um, so we're super excited to have Brennan here working, working with us and work, talking to you all today. Um, Elena is a senior data scientist at Cubic, working with Brennan, where she's responsible for guiding associate data scientists and coordinating technical activities um, with their backend engineers and putting their products into production. Um, uh, she's very fond of street photography and has learned that a lot of the data products tell their own stories and there's a natural synergy there. So Elena, thank you for, for joining and being with us today. Um, and then from Urban Institute, we're very uh, excited and happy to have Claire McKay Bowen working with us. Um, she's a lead data scientist for privacy and data security at the Urban Institute. Uh, her research focuses on developing and assessing the quality of differentially private data um, and synthesis methods um, within the science community. Um, in 2001, the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies identified her as an emerging leader in statistics for her technical contributions and leadership to statistics in the field of data privacy and confidentiality. So thank you to the three of you for being with us today. Um, and thank you for all your contributions as we're working on differential privacy together. So just to give you a little overview of smart noise, um, as you've been learning about OpenDP or as you, as you know already about OpenDP, um, OpenDP is this core library, which is gonna enable all of our additional applications and additional scenarios on top of it. Um, Smart Noise is the first one of these that we've been collaborating with the OpenDP team on. Um, it's a library, it's built on top of the core library within OpenDP. And there's really two primary application scenarios that we're, we're supporting right now. The first one is um, the ability to do automatic inter, uh, interactions with a SQL database, you know, producing simple analytics on queries, but applying differential privacy. So you're thinking about things like counts and histograms and means, quantiles, et cetera, with different mechanisms and utilities. A lot of these come from the OpenDP core library. And what we're doing is we're trying to find a nice way to surface it, bubble it up and provide it um, in a way that allows you to interact with a SQL database. So that's the first key scenario that we work on. Um, the second one is a set of synthesizers that we've also built um, to produce synthetic data sets. Um, and so this has been a collaboration uh, that Joshua Allen has led on the, on the Microsoft side to give the capability for teams to come in, understand how they want to produce some synthetic data uh, with the different combinations that are important to them, and then produce that synthetic data. And that's an area that we can talk about um, in the Q&A. We get Joshua here if people are curious about that. So um, we've had a, a wonderful collaboration with the Harvard and the OpenDP team in general. Um, I like to list everyone's names here because although um, there's been different people that have been day in and day out on this, everyone that's on this list has contributed in one way or another. Um, so with that, about four or five months ago, we launched a program to support teams who are interested in differential privacy and building these applications, but may need a little bit of help. And so we created the Smart Noise Early Adopter Program. Um, and really the focus of this program was to accelerate the usage of the product um, and solutions to migrate them in a way that they will make, uh, make their way to production. Um, it was a six month collaboration with our team and we're at about, about month four right now. And really um, one of the larger goals in addition to getting teams to use uh, Smart Noise and the OpenDP core library in, in production was to drive some shared learnings, to bring, um, bring understanding back to the community here. And, you know, and to a certain degree, open up data. Um, I sit in the AI for good space at Microsoft. So anytime that we can 
find collaborations where we're opening data for researchers to help with society is really important to us. Um, when we when we reviewed a bunch of applications, it was really interesting to see the diversity of industries that were coming forward who are curious about using differential privacy and their scenarios. And just to kind of name a couple here, um, we had the cybersecurity uh, customer come through, but what they were looking for is to provide greater privacy protections within their internal metrics and um, great use of differential privacy. We had a disaster preparedness and resilience organization come forward and they're really trying to share mobility data among researchers to help with operational response, um, planning, disaster uh, preparedness. Um, we've had teams in education come forward who would like to put educational outcome for researchers where there, um, you know, there are certain data sets that just are not available outside of the boundaries of very tight privacy. So how can we kind of enable more, even if it's metrics to get out there? Um, same thing with health pushing more social determinants of health out there from a health commercial company to the research community. Um, mobility intelligence, um, I think we will we'll let the Cubic team speak for themselves here. Um, and then there was a privacy data platform uh, team that came who was really looking to integrate um, differential privacy into their enterprise collaboration tools and their toolkits so that when they're going forward with plugins in different, um, different products that they produce, that data that they that they show to their customers has differential privacy applied. And lastly, we got the public policy team here at um, Urban Institute, and I'm going to let Claire kind of talk about that. But I wanted to share these with everyone just so there is a, a, a common um, baseline of the diversity of uh, scenarios that we're seeing come our way. And I think that's really exciting. It's definitely in a place where um, we are now seeing more and more uptick with people asking questions about differential privacy, asking how it can work for them, and now even coming forward with um, questions, can I use it for this scenario? So with that, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to the Cubic team. We'll turn it over to Brennan to give their presentation and Elena. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and Brennan, let you take over. Thanks so much, Kevin. Can folks hear me? Gotcha. Perfect. And then I'll ask one more little test if you can see my screen. We can. Wonderful. Um, so as Kevin mentioned, my name is Brennan Lake, and I'm the VP of Research Partnerships and Data for Good at Cubic. Uh, here today, I'll talk a little bit about Cubic in general and our Data for Good program. And then my colleague Elena will talk about, you know, why differential privacy is important to us and what we've specifically worked on through the Smart Noise program and applying differential privacy to our different data sets. So to provide you a little overview of Cubic, Cubic is a privacy first geospatial data and analytics platform. And we partner with location-centric smartphone apps to collect first-party data from users who have provided informed consent specifically to allow Cubic by name to uh, collect data anonymously for a number of different purposes, like on the commercial end, advertising analytics and uh, retail store footfall analytics, and also they provide informed consent on the data for good side to provide access to their data anonymously for use in academic research and humanitarian initiatives. So through our data for good program, we partner with academic institutions, NGOs and multilaterals, for example, like the World Bank and UNICEF to provide aggregate data uh, for academic research and humanitarian initiatives related to human mobility. That includes use cases like urban development and social equity, natural disaster response, and epidemiology as well, as you'll see through some of these examples. So when the pandemic emerged as a global health threat, we activated a lot of the existing academic and multilateral partners that we had through our existing data for good program, some of whom had actually worked on epidemiological modeling using our data, for example, related to uh, the Zika epidemic in 2016. Uh, the world began to ask questions that mobility data could answer to a certain degree 
like how often are people coming together in close physical proximity? How do people travel between different cities? How is this affecting, for example, um, economic activity in different main streets and retail areas? And other questions like how does inequality affect the ability of different people to adhere to non-pharmaceutical interventions, for example, those are who are less economically advantaged who have to continue working throughout the day. So together with a lot of our academic partners and our own data scientists, we developed multiple aggregate metrics to measure different uh, areas and dynamics of human mobility. These metrics include things like a simple mobility index to figure out what is the median distance traveled of users uh, within certain areas like counties, and other uh, metrics, for example, like the rate of close proximity contacts in a privacy preserving way, also at the county level. Uh, one big challenge, though, is that while well, county of level is a fantastic unit of analysis for a lot of epidemiological modeling, there are instances in which, for example, you know, city governments or others can benefit from more granular insights, for example, at the census tract level or at the census block group level. So that was a challenge that emerged. Meanwhile, uh, in parallel to this, we had also been working a lot on natural disaster response. Specifically, we'd worked with a number of different partners to use mobility data in order to measure evacuation rates during natural disasters. And together with our team at Cubic, among our data science team and data engineers, like my colleague Elena, who's joining us today, they were able to develop a simple evacuation metric that looks at percentage of populations that evacuate from counties during natural disasters while also providing advanced metrics like what are the destination counties that evacuees head to um, and also what is the breakdown in terms of income of evacuees. Do we see wealthier people being able to evacuate while lower income communities are less able to and so on. This is another area where, you know, perhaps for rural counties, providing insights at the county level could suffice. But at the same time, if you're talking about disasters like hurricanes that can hit urban areas like, you know, Houston during Hurricane Harvey or the entire state of Florida during Hurricane Irma in, I think that was 2017 or 2018, it's really important to be able to look at dynamics at a more granular level. At the same time, though, as a company that embraces privacy by design at our core, it's really important that any of these aggregate data sets that we share preserve the privacy of the users who have entrusted us with their data. So that's why we were intrigued to join the Smart Noise program and to look at ways that we could adapt these types of metrics at a more granular level, like the census block group level, while preserving privacy. And to actually get into the meat of this and to talk about the specifics, I'm gonna hand over the virtual mic to my colleague, Elena, um, and I'll let her uh, share her screen as well so that she can run through the rest of the slides. And happy to chat during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Brennan. Do you hear me? We can hear you. So, okay, I think I'm presenting now. Yeah, so we decided not to start right away with the evacuation rates use case, uh, but to start with a much uh, easier use case um, in order to, you know, first off, understand how differential privacy works in general and uh, in detail how the Microsoft Smart Noise uh, library works too. Um, here, the goal is to create, show the US map, uh, reporting information about our proprietary um, mobility index. And it's a public dashboard uh, reporting information by, by county. Um, and with what we did here uh, was basically to add two main uh, functionalities. The very first one um, is a finer grain of the geospatial filter. We moved from county to zip code level. And we also 
chose to provide a further estimate, um, which is the estimate of the error that we were making while providing DP, um, DP data. Um, as, as an estimate of the error, we chose uh, the 95th percentile of the distribution of the errors, and we decided to um, filter out altogether the, the zip code reporting errors um, to much great, uh, so greater than 100%. Uh, we are talking about relative errors. And this was, this was very great uh, because we were able to uh, get results very quickly um, using the, the Smart Noise SDK because uh, we didn't add, yeah, we didn't need to change so much our algorithm since you can um, literally pass directly your queries um, to the library. And what we did need uh, to do was um, essentially two, two steps. First of all, uh, bounding our row values. So we, as Bernard said, we have, um, we have distances, um, distance values, and we wanted to compute the median. Uh, we bounded the values in order to have the smart noise SDK compute the sensitivity. And also, uh, we needed to choose the privacy budget. Uh, we did so um, in an empiric way, so exploring the distribution of the errors. And finally, we set uh, epsilon to one um, to yeah to compromise accuracy and, and privacy. And about the delta, um, we moved from the original value, uh, I mean the default value of the of the library. Um, in order to get, in order to increase um, accuracy and performances. Uh, we use um, a rule of thumb um, that we found in literature, uh, since we did know roughly the number of users that we have, um, that we have daily. And um, so as you uh, may have understood, uh, we are talking about Epsilon Delta um, DP, um, and that's because the default distribution of the error of the smart noise SDK is the Gaussian. And yeah, it was pretty much it. We computed uh, the um, DDP results for each aggregation level independently. And we were able to create a mapping, a fixed mapping between the group cardinality and the error estimate in order to filter out the uh, two bad results, as I said before. And we were able to do so um, because the, we are considering mean queries here and the sensitivity um, only depends on, on the number of the users per group. Uh, and that's because in general you have um, that the mean queries depends on, I mean, the sensitivity of, of the mean queries depends on the maximum and minimum value over the size of the group. But here, since we bounded our original values, um, the maximum and minimum are fixed. And so we were able to do multiple runs of our DP algorithm and get a distribution of the error per bucket of users and then compute the estimate of the error as the 95 um, percentile of the distribution. And as far for the evacuation rates, uh, we are, this is an ongoing project um, and we are following the, the same steps. Uh, so bounding our original values, um, applying DDP, uh, exploring the distribution of the errors and so on. Um, here, um, the problem is uh, far more complex uh, than the preliminary study that uh, we did. And that's because um, in, case, in the case of um, the cubic mobility index, we uh, do have just one metric. While here we have three different metrics because we have um, the mean um, also here because um, we wanted to Monitor, monitor the uh, distance from home uh, of the evacuees, but we also have counts uh, because we need to uh, compute the total population by group and the number of evacuees. And then we also have the sum um, because um, that enables us to infer the destination county, basically. Um, it's, it's applied on the dual time spent over the day per, per county. And so this is far more complex. Uh, we are um, still exploring 
and we are uh, testing also, I mean, we get preliminary results with the Smart Noise SDK, but when we decided to move uh, to the core library in order to increase flexibility and performances because uh, we can use um, different me mechanisms. So we are trying Laplace, uh, geometric and so on. And also another important point here is that with uh, just one metric, uh, we can define um, a privacy budget, which is unique and global. And here we have three different metrics. So how to um, you know, split the privacy budget in order to not, in order to not release so much. It's it's very it's very delicate delicate, and I think that's it. Um, thank you so much for having us. And well, I wanna also thank our lead uh, of the project, which is uh, who is not here today because he's on holiday. Um, so yeah, I think I stop sharing. Well, well thank you, Elena, and thank you, uh, Brennan, for that. We'll hold questions for the end, everybody. Um, and now we're gonna turn it over to Claire to talk about her work and her team's work at the Urban Institute. Claire? <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. So I'm really excited to be talking about this really great project that we've been working on at the Urban Institute in collaboration with Smart Noise, uh, where, that which we refer to as the validation server project. So before we go into the full details, I want to say thank you to our funders, Arnold Ventures, NSF, and the Arnold, uh, excuse me, Alfred Sloan Foundation. And of course, our awesome team, it, this is a huge project and involves a lot of people. And of course, we would like to thank our advisory board who have been incredibly invaluable in giving us great feedback to make sure that we're not really crazy on some of the ideas that we're thinking about and also providing us uh, additional testers for our validation server, which I'll talk about in a moment. So for this presentation, I'm going to briefly go over some of the motivation, the project overview, and then the future state. And since it's only 15 minutes, I can't go into all the nitty gritty details. So please feel free to reach out to me to get more details or learn more in general about this project and all the great things that we're doing. So the motivation, uh, we are a public policy research institution, and so one of the things that we are very concerned about is accessing data to make more data informed decision making. And this becomes more apparent, especially with the fact that, well, on this first day in office, Biden made an executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. And this calls for having more disaggregated data or just generally more data available for researchers and others to make these very important decisions. But that's really tricky because, uh, as we know, about privacy. And so some people kind of miss the mark on like, well, how do we normally access like, this confidential data? And so just to go through this very quickly, because many of you already know this, that usually we try to hear what we uh, can from the users and take their queries as the data privacy experts and then work in collaboration with the data maintainers or the curators. So in this case, it's the federal agency because they have access to the original data because they collect it. And we try to work with them to figure out what is the best approach to alter the data in such a way that it can still be useful for the users, either a form of an interface for queries or a public use file. And so this has worked for quite some time. So why now question this whole scheme of things? Well, as we know, there's an incredible increase of data and computing power nowadays. And the example I like to give uh, to people is that our smartphones today are more powerful than the average computer desktop that we had access over 10 years, ago, just a little over 10 years ago. And so this increases the risk of re-identifying individuals and in the survey and administrative data in federal agencies. There's also the issue of how do we actually measure privacy risks, because a lot of the methods, especially in statistical disclosure and control, will have been very ad hoc. And so it's really hard to predict exactly how somebody's going to attack the data. And another big thing for, especially for the federal agencies, is that survey response rates have been severely declining. And we saw that with the 2020 census too, it's like all time low. So there is more interest in using administrative data for research, but those tend to be more confidential, it's harder to access. So that becomes a problem. Well, then some people think, well, why don't we use synthetic data to solve this issue? Well, that, in our case, because we're working on tax data, well, that's that's fine if you have a specific uh, use case. So uh, for the Urban Institute, we 
often do what we call micro simulation modeling, where we try to do a counterfactual on the data. So let's say a presidential candidate proposes a new tax policy plan. We take whatever that policy plan is going to be, try to run it on our model to see whether or how it's going to affect the average American and what is it actually going to raise rates, it's going to lower them, so on and so forth. So synthetic data is a great solution for this, but it's not quite if, if they have more complex modeling. So the, some of our tax experts says that some of the modeling they like to do is like regression discontinuity design or king point design, which are not exactly ideal for doing modeling that on synthetic data because synthetic data tends to smooth out a lot of those features that are important for those more complex uh, modeling or excuse me, uh, analyses that tax experts want to do. So this brings up the whole, well, if they need access to the finer grain data, uh, why don't they get, apply for full access? And so, yeah, in an idealized world, it'd be great to give trust researchers direct access to data, but there are several hurdles. So first off, some of the data, including this IRS data that we're working on, it has eligibility requirement that you must be a US citizen. Uh, it also requires a lengthy clearance process that can take months or years. And as somebody who has different types of clearances, it doesn't get easier each time. It still takes several months to get access to the data. And then finally, uh, as somebody who has clearance, I either have to have requests like a special uh, laptop, which is not always given, or they say, hey, you have to go to the on-site uh, office or go to a nearby federal research data center, but that's not very equitable in terms of data access because, for instance, for me, some people think I'm in D.C., but I'm actually located in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the closest federal research data center is in Denver for me, or Boulder, Denver area, and that's a seven-hour drive, so that's not exactly, again, equitable for me to do the kind of analysis I need to do. So then what is this project and what kind of the problems we're trying to solve with this? So we're looking at how can we fill in this like kind of tiered access, as we call it, for administrative tax data, because our ultimate goal is to enable more researchers to safely access confidential data. I've already talked about how we have kind of this basic access already where actually for the taxpayer data with IRS, it's what they call a synthetic public use file or PUF. So you'll see PUF a lot here. Uh, this is uh, you can access it through, it's actually requested by a fee, so it's not so publicly available, but you can apply for it and then pay the fee and then you get access to this data. So that's their version of like what we're calling uh, basic access when you get the public use file. Or you could get full access, so you have to go through the clearance process, and then like I said, you get access to the unaltered confidential data either by having a IRS laptop or going to one of their on-site locations or the Federal Research Data Center. And so again, you're wondering, okay, wonderful, Claire. Uh, got that, but what exactly are you doing? So we're looking at creating the validation server access level where we have a, like a very light background check on a researcher just to make sure that they are trusted to access the validation server. They will debug and test. So the idea is, again, to debug and test their statistical analyses or what kind of regression models or whatever they want to do on their synthetic puff and before submitting it through this terminal that's the validation server so that will access the confidential data and then return a altered result back. And so some of you might be aware of already that Census has a form of this through Cornell University, but the problem with that one is that it's not automated. So for those who are familiar, you still do test your statistical analyses on the synthetic data that's publicly available and then you submit it to the your analysis to the I think it's the was it the uh, now I can't remember uh, the the term they use for their validation server but you submit it through their their portal and it could take weeks to get back to you because often the demand exceeds uh, the time available because it has to be manually vetted by a staff member and so not having this automation really does slow down quite a bit of the process for for research. And so with this project, we we're trying to figure out, can we like pilot an automated validation server? And so this is a multi-year project that has generally three components that we describe here as trying to figure out what is the prototype to do summary statistics and regression models. Uh, the other component is like, how do we launch this on the cloud? So that way, again, trying to avoid that whole hurdle if you have to go to a research data center or get access to a specialized laptop or computer. That way we're trying to see like, how can we make a secure cloud-based platform that anybody can access if as long as they have uh, access to the internet. And then the final component into extending the validation server beyond just uh, ordinarily squares regressions, doing like 
more complex analyses that especially for taxpayer or excuse me, uh, tax experts are really interested in. And within each of these components, there are several stages for completion. So these are just, again, the broad ones that I'm describing here. So in the big picture of where we're at so far, uh, so components one and two have been moving in parallel for the last 10 months. Uh, so just for those who are curious, uh, we're complete, we are completing the feasibility study that is exploring the landscape of various to apply differentially private methods, trying to figure out what is the, the best way forward on like which methods work out well for certain kind of analyses. That actually will be published on archive by the end of this month, or I guess that would be within a week, actually. So Keep your eye out for that. Uh, we've also been looking at how we would build that cloud prototype. Uh, so instead of actually having the confidential data, we're actually having the stand-in data, which is the public use file, uh, and running a lot of the the toolkit from smart noise to run the counts summary and other silent statistics on there. And we've been building that with their amazing support. And so also we're exploring methods and uh, work needed for the extended server and outlining some feature work. So now you're kind of wondering, what is the future state? What is going on here? So as I mentioned, we're kind of wrapping up a bit on our initial uh, parts for the components one and two. So we're actually going to finalize our initial build with the like, user interface, the API middleware, and backend by the end of this month. Uh, again, this was uh, with great uh, technical assistance and support from the open source libraries provided by OpenDP and SmartNoise uh, through their early accelerator program. And then over the next year, we're going to be testing and iterating our our prototype, which is you can access it through any web browser again, and but it's password protected right now because we are still testing it out and making sure that it makes sense. Are we presenting the materials correctly? Are is everything interacting well? So on and so forth. And so this is going to require like testing with privacy experts, uh, data stewards, administrators, uh, other kind of researchers, data practitioners, and of course, our partners at IRS. And throughout this whole process, uh, all the code is open source and all the documentation that we'll have, like lessons learned, because we know that we're not going to get it right the first time. And even if we think we did a really good job, imagine that we will miss something. And so we welcome the community to give us feedback and say, hey, uh, that's great that you did this kind of feature, but I would really want to have this kind of analysis and like the way you set it up isn't ideal for me. And so again, we're welcoming that feedback from all of you. And so here is a quick screenshot. This was actually an old one, but I'm gonna give you a quick sneak peek of our, I think, can you guys see this? So here is actually the live version of our user, or excuse me, our validation server. I've already kind of tested some things. So it already has like the unlock here to go steps two and three, but we're still testing it out, uh, making sure everything is interacting correctly. But for those of you who are interested, it is, it's gonna be up live soon. So with that, we'll comment. If you're interested in being a tester, please reach out to me. I'm, we're again, we're trying to get all, a wide variety of perspectives to make sure that we're hitting uh, not missing anything at least. And so with that, here's my contact information. I think I'm pretty easy to find too. So, or you could reach out to Kevin to get my information if he's okay with that. Fine with me. <laughs> okay, I, that's the end. So I will stop sharing. Awesome. Well, thank you, Claire. That was a wonderful presentation and the work that you and your team are doing is super exciting. I think it's gonna be uh, super beneficial for everyone. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up for questions. And so if you have a question um, to ask uh, either of the teams, uh, go ahead and use the raise your hand uh, function and we will uh, we'll, um, we'll call people out and you're getting a clap from Phil. New virtual. Okay, well, while, while we're waiting for someone to raise their hand, let me ask maybe a, a starter question. Um, either for any of the panelists, Elena or Claire, is there anything in using OpenDP that you, um, uh, you know, that you thought was more challenging than you had expected or was easier than you had expected in using kind of the technology? Just opening it up. So, oh. Both, well, well, sh share your perspectives for the, the group. And then Kristen, Christine, I see Christine as a hand, so we'll do this quick and then we'll get to her question. Yeah, as far as the SDK, for sure easier because we did expect to have a lot, a lot more changes of our algorithm 
and actually we didn't need to do so much um, to get a very first yeah dashboard version of the dashboard um, so that was super a little bit trickier uh, though was for sure the choice of the privacy budget because moving from the theory to the application and having uh, results that were actually meaningful uh, was not so easy. Thanks for sharing. Claire, any thoughts on your side? Well, I wish Kyle was here because he was the one who was interacting more with your code than I was because I was working more on the, the feasibility study aspect. Uh, well, from what I remember him saying, it, there was like a few uh, hurdles on trying to like connect everything together because it was such a, like a complex system that we were trying to build. Uh, one of the nice things though was when we were saying like, hey, we want to report the uh, error bounds how can we do that and josh was like oh i have that i just have it dormant because i didn't know if it would be useful and so that was really awesome that josh was like yeah we're, we're, we'll do this and i'll i'll get it all set up and so we're like oh this is great so i i guess like shout out to the team for being so responsive and like seeing our github <laughs> issues when we were like hey can we do this and usually i was like within like that day josh was like yeah this is the the part and uh I just I thought it was very phenomenal with the, the collaboration. So awesome. Thank you. And I think that's a good good point to put out to everyone here. Um, the teams that are working this on this are very passionate. So if you interact with the community and you find issues, you have ideas, you know, please interact with us and the teams will get to it pretty quickly. Um, Christine, I see you had your hand up and then uh, Salil has his hand up next. So we'll do Christine first. Um, just real quick, uh, Claire, you mentioned you were trying out different techniques. I was just curious which ones. You're saying that for the feasibility study? Yeah. Yeah. So we broadly put them into three groups of tabular, tabular statistics, summary statistics, where that would be like means quantiles. And then we looked at ordinary least squares and we called it a feasibility study because we did it in the context of the tax analyses that people would do. And so there were some methods that were automatically eliminated actually from our testing because they didn't satisfy sort of the requirements that we expected, like a user coming into the to this uh, validation server. So you, the full paper, which is already growing to over 30 pages long, it's, it's pretty extensive. We, <laughs> I know I see people laughing at us because <laughs> yeah, we, we did a very thorough review. One of the things I will say to like the community that it was actually really difficult for us was getting full inference on some of the uh, statistical analyses where we were trying to do, in particular regression. So getting ones that could provide a confidence interval around coefficients. And so that's actually another one that eliminated some methods because we couldn't do inferences. Uh, we did do some like Frankenstein. I say we, as in, I shout out to Felipe. He was the one who's like, well, I think we should do this to get more methods together. And we're like, that sounds great. You're awesome. And so that's how we were able to do more testing is because he kind of merged a lot of different methods together to make them work. And it was actually really cool to do that. So again, that's going to be on archive hopefully a week from today. We were just trying to finalize a code review to make sure that we actually implemented all the methods right. So anyways, that was a longer explanation. But again, happy to talk about that more later. <clears throat> that's awesome. I look forward to reading it. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Salil? Yeah, um, this connects, I think, very much with uh, um, Claire's answer just now to Christine and, and your question earlier, Kevin. And um, and that is um, both uh, Elena and Claire, do you have any, you know, sort of calls to the to the research community, the DP research community, the, the open DP community about these are methods we really needed and we couldn't find them in the literature. They don't seem to exist, but we really need something that does, does this or that. Or um, there is something in the literature, but no one seems to have implemented it. And uh, it would be great if someone did an open DP implementation of this method or that method so that we could use it together with the other you know, methods that we're using from the smart noise SDK. If Alain doesn't mind me, jumping first, just to expand on my answer to Christine earlier. So definitely getting full inferences on these different models or different private methods, uh, that was really tricky. And again, eliminated a lot of possible methods for us to actually fully test. Uh, the other thing, and I mean, I have a general long list of things I think the community can work on, but in particular for that project, 
uh, one of the other things is just having some code available because that actually slowed us down quite a bit was just trying to find some code that I like we, we don't expect researchers to provide really awesome code like Microsoft did <laughs> for the smart rowers program what we expect is having some code that is like a little bit generalized and not so specific to their project or even okay that that's like a wonderful ass of me but or like too maybe too much but even just any code because we ended up like begging authors for a bit but then after a while we're like okay well we haven't heard anything so I guess we're gonna have to try figuring this out which is why we're in the midst of a code review to try to make sure we implemented it correctly because some of these methods are super complex and it would have been really nice to at least get the source code from like the simulations that the authors had done thanks yeah I have nothing to add I completely agree with that All right. Um, let's see. I think, uh, was there another hand up? I thought I saw one. Oh, there we go. Jillian. You're on mute, my friend. Great presentations. Thanks. That really helped me to understand really well what this is all about. Quick question. Um, when you create differentially private data, you often have to go through post-processing to make it look right. I mean, a simple example is just rounding counts to, to nearest numbers. Now, does the um, smart noise application do that kind of thing for you? And is it possible to incorporate the lack of utility that happens with that, because it can be really destructive, um, into your error estimates? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to actually call on Joshua, who's our smart noise architect, who's on the call here, to answer that. Joshua? Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question. So um, we do support, uh, you know, clamping counts to be non-negative and also making sure that counts are integers. Uh, we have a few other kind of post-processing type things that we support. Um, but to your point, it's, uh, you know, it's exactly the case. Like if you make sure you have non-negative counts, then you end up with biased data in your buckets and so on. So at the moment, um, what we've done uh, in the link that I, uh, that I shared with Damien a moment ago, we show how to like in our broadband data set, we used those, you know, those approaches and then we just report the bias in the numbers. Or so you, can re know. you can rescale very easily sometimes, but you don't quite know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, a lot of that, like that kind of stuff, like reporting bias or reporting error bounds are kind of things that we leave to the, you know, to the user. Right. Good. Anyhow, thanks, everybody. Great, great talks. Yeah, and, and, and to the riff a little bit on that, the archive link that Joshua shared was from a, um, a use case, another use case. We didn't present it here, but it was a Microsoft use case where we opened up broadband data. Uh, by zip code um, to allow with policy decisions. You can read more about it in the in the archive, but it does have some interesting, um, you know, some interesting perspectives on how we solve for low counts by zip codes, and um, you know, provided at least some guardrails for researchers so that they could make decisions um, on the data. So, um, so with that, I, I think we are at time. Eleven o'clock on the dot. Um, again, I just wanted to thank our presenters. Um, I want to thank Cubic and Urban Institute and all the other organizations who are really pushing the forefront here and helping us. They're, they're, I think we're helping society, but we're also helping learn more about how we can make this technology more applicable um, and useful for researchers. Um, love to just do another shout out to the OpenDP team. They're fantastic partners um, at Microsoft. We are so excited that we get to work with them every week um, and they're doing a great job with this and we hope to see this continue to grow. Um, so with that, um, thank you everybody. We'll see you in a future session. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Thank you everyone. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, Claire, Elena, and Brennan. Um, we will be back in about 15 minutes, 14, 15 minutes for the next session, which is a panel discussion on federated learning.